This is the uh, Tennessee Native Plant Society uh, Native Plant Seminar, and tonight's speaker is Robin Whitfield. Her topic is the color of conservation. Robin is what I would call uh, an artist and an activist. She's uh, got her finger in both fields and combines them very, very nicely. Um, Robin paints on location with watercolor, experiments with foraged wild pigments. She has a special interest in exploring native habitats on public land in Mississippi where she lives, not far from Memphis. Uh, she relates what's happening with the paint um, the paints that she uh, picks up in nature and does a lovely job. Um, she's been involved with Elite Tart Nature Preserve and friends of, I'm not going to say that <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll help you later. Tuma, yeah. <laughs> Tactuma Swamp. That's excellent. Where she's uh, listed as director and visionary. She's often found saving native plants from roadside ditches. She encourages kids to play with mud and that's kids of any age. Folks. That's right. <laughs> We're not leaving you out. And wholeheartedly she shares her magic with everyone and anyone and anything wherever she goes. She's <laughs> very enthusiastic. And I think this is gonna be a, a very interesting and lively uh, talk tonight. So. <laughs> Hold on to your hats and Robin, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Um, I love that introduction uh, so much. <laughs> um, so y'all, thank you for having me and um, native plants have been a passion of mine. I was just telling them since I was in high school and I even began to understand that, that uh, what a native plant was. Um, but my presentation tonight is really going to be centered around something that's very, uh, which this is very important to me. And that is, I want everyone to know that they are a creative being. I believe all human, I think what makes a human animal special amongst animals or amongst beings on the planet is that we are creative. And I think creativity is a way to explore the world using our senses and really be in a place and plants invite us to do that. Um, and so I want to start off my presentation with an actual video that uh, I made last year with a friend of mine. You now, last year was such an interesting year for me, and I'm sure all of us. I had a lot of extra time, as did my friends and at creative friends. And so um, I was able to dream up and do things like videos. And I realized it was an important media as well. So the, the, the film is a little, it's an 18 minute film that uh, I created through my nonprofit, Friends of Chuckchuma Swamp. Um, at Lee Tart Nature Preserve in Grenada, Mississippi. And I'm going to show you the very first part, and then we're going to stop it and kind of move it to the end. But I believe Karen's going to share the link if y'all would care to see the entire thing or maybe share it with someone else. I feel like it might, it, it, we made it to share with uh, homeschoolers and um, a, we were actually hired by a, school, by a school to produce this film, but I think it really applies to all like kids of all ages, as you were saying. So with that said, y'all pardon me if uh, my technical abilities uh, mess this up, but I was practicing before y'all all got here. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm going to share my screen and uh, let's see here. I think I did that right. And y'all see my screen? Yes. All right, so I'm going to come over here to YouTube. This is on YouTube. And hang on, let me pull y'all down here. And would okay, you like on. to read off the um, address on YouTube? And I'll um, go back to chat. Let's see. Yeah, so okay. I'm going to. I can see it. I'll take that back. Okay. Oh, yeah, y'all see it? Yes. And I'm going to. Okay, so I think this is, are y'all seeing a full screen? Yes. All right, well, we're going to go, I'm going I'm to let it play for about five minutes, and then we're going to scooch forward. Thank you. 
Hey y'all, I'm Robin Whitfield. I'm an artist who loves nature. I love spending time in nature, particularly at a place called Lee Tart Nature Preserve, which is where we're standing right now. Over the years, I've also come to understand the needs a place like this has, and I've started an organization called Friends of Chichuma Swamp. And what we believe is that curiosity, creativity, and connection are all a part of becoming a good conservationist. So today, we're going to be taking those three things and uh, going on an adventure with them. Let's go. The first part of this adventure is going to be looking for a tree to spend a little bit of time with. You each need to be searching for a tree that, that really speaks to you, but maybe is not too close to someone else's tree, so that you kind of have your own space and can kind of get lost in the moment. Because that's really the purpose of this activity, is to get really um, connected to this moment, this place, and to the tree that you're going to stop at. Any tree will work. You can find a tree in your yard. You can go uh, look around your school campus or maybe a park. Ultimately, I think this would be most amazing if you could find a tree located in a wild place. That could be um, any sort of public land like a national wildlife refuge or a state park or a wildlife management area. Or maybe your family has some land, maybe a hunting camp. Anywhere where your tree has more trees around it. And whenever that happens, we tend to call a collective of trees a woodland or a forest. And this is the one. I like this uh, particular activity because it's so simple. You don't need anything but paper and a pencil. And what I've brought today is really my favorite kind of paper to work with. It is a thicker paper. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a watercolor paper, and I just like the heaviness because I can basically do a little bit more, maybe rub or, or push a little bit harder on it. You can use any kind of pencil, marker, pen that you want. I brought a marker today, so um, it could be a little bit darker, but anything will work. I'm going to call this activity PALS. PALS, pay attention, look slow. That's how you're going to go about this. But I also want you to remember that this is really about trying to make an exchange and have a connection with the tree, about becoming his pal, like you would any friend. And yes, a lot of trees have similar characteristics, but I want you to really get to know the tree you're in front of as an individual. What makes it unique? It's characteristics that would stand out if you saw it in a lineup of other trees. By the end of this activity, I want you to know your tree. So the first thing is to walk around the tree, all the way around it, looking on it, above it, on the ground. But ultimately, I want you to kind of come back to where you started uh, having selected a leaf. And I want you to select a leaf that you believe came from the tree you're engaging with. So the first thing I want you to do is make a circle around your leaf. In this activity, you're going to put things in this circle that relate to the things you discover about the tree itself. The things that relate to its leaves, to its roots, to its seeds, flowers, anything that is about the tree you're with. And we're gonna start with the leaf. And this is what I want you to do. Just, first of all, observe its overall shape its uniqueness amongst the other leaves that you found. You picked this one out of all the ones you saw. So step one, I want you to just actually trace it. And I know you might could draw it without tracing it, but I think tracing it might be uh, a way to help look slow. Now I'm gonna kinda do a, um, an overall shape thing here. All right, I'm stopping there and I'm gonna scoot y'all forward. Um, I just wanna give y'all a sense of kind of how this activity worked and what it was about. And I'm gonna scoot forward to uh, right. Let's see, 1439, okay. The third ring is um, the last part of this uh, adventure or exploration. I want you to look up at your tree's canopy 
and really notice where its edge ends, where the influence of its shadow, of maybe where it shelters from the rain, um, where it uh, creates its own little micro environment. I want you to kind of notice where that ends and the, um, I'm gonna call outside your tree's influence begins and maybe spend some time exploring for a few minutes. Let's even compare, let's just say, this is like you and your friend. This is you getting to know, uh, you know your friend. This is like your friend's friends, okay? These are the relationships the tree has with other things. So these are, this, this circle is gonna be more like acquaintances. These are more like the people you know, or the, this is the thing your, your tree knows the relationships that you're gonna put on the outside of, of this circle, but it's just not as close. It's not on that inner circle as we might call our, our close friend group, so. What's cool about this uh, this plant is it, in the fall, it's got these awesome berries. They are also amazing as a color. Some people call them ink berries. I'm gonna use this feather as my uh, tool. I, I, I like finding tools on location. You could use a stick in the same way. And um, I'm gonna go inside that berry and make my observation. I don't want you to feel like you have to be caught up in making a drawing that looks exactly like what you're seeing. I'm wanting you to use the drawing to see. So this activity is really about making a connection and not just a connection, but having an exchange between you and another living thing, particularly a tree. So y'all have a great time finding your tree, finding a cool location and finding a pal. see if I can uh, now figure out how to get back to y'all. <laughs> um, am I back? You're back with that, all, your face and all of our faces. Okay, excellent. Um, all right, well, I hope y'all enjoyed that. And, and maybe if, if, at this point, y'all might be thinking, wow, she's out there. <laughs> um, I have found that uh, working directly with nature for myself and for other really breaks down a barrier um, that maybe either there's, if, if you think I've done this with garden club groups and I don't know what all that, you know, I give them a piece of paper and I invite them to use berries or flowers will go out into their garden. And you've never seen some, some women get more excited to see what rose petals look like. And so it's, it's a way, to, it's a way to engage. So I'm going to be, get, uh, I'm about to, let's see share my screen again and I am going to um I've put together a presentation um last year for a museum that I thought would go perfectly with what I wanted to share with y'all tonight and um so let me try to uh get that done let's see here and hang on Here's my prelude. Let's see here. We were practicing and I'm, oh, I pre pressed that. Yes, there it is. All right. How am I doing, Karen? Can y'all see my presentation? We can see fine. Looks good. All right. Well, I'm going to, let's see here. View. I'm going to slide it down a little bit. 
Okay. There oh, we go. There you go. I'm gonna say view, and I'm gonna say enter full screen. And I don't know. Do y'all are y'all seeing that looking perfect. kind of bluish? Hmm. <laughs> it's perfect. All right. I'm gonna come over here. I'm You're come... working like a pro here. All right. <laughs> I'm learning stuff. All right, y'all. So I'm gonna kind of come backwards from where. What y'all, what the video really just kind of showed me where I am right now in my life. But I, I want to kind of go backwards for a minute because um, I feel like I really want to um, encourage everyone to, to enter into that part of themselves that's creative and embrace that. And I, I don't think it, our, our culture doesn't make that easy for um, a lot of us to do. And so I would like to just start by telling y'all that I never, I didn't even know what the word conservation meant for, certainly till I was an adult. And I was a very shy person who really felt more at home in nature than um, with people. And so that got me outside looking. So <clears throat> I really believe that plants, um, in my certain ability to see color, um, helped me to become who I am. And so what I would like to start off with is, oops, hang on, I gotta figure out how, okay, there it is. So I've kind of organized this around the concept of color because for me, color was the most powerful language I had as a young person because I didn't have a voice with language. I was so shy. And so what we're gonna start off with is I'm gonna kind of go quickly a little bit from, through this first part um, and, uh, I am so scared I'm going to spend too long on uh, uh, talking with y'all about some of my very favorite things. But um, what I want you to understand, color is a language. And I didn't understand it in that way. Um, I couldn't have put words on that as a child, but I just knew that I noticed things in nature uh, that made me feel certain ways and made me notice certain things. And I like to explore that in my sketchbook and with paint. And so I continued to do that. I studied painting at Delta State and um, wanted to be the kind of, I, I remember thinking as a child, I want to be the kind of adult that spends all their time outside um, you know, looking at nature. And so I just went about, on, I, I set my course uh, to do that. I didn't know how to do that, but, um, but I guess we never know how to do what we're doing until we're doing it. So I'm going to show you all a little bit of, uh, so these are some of my watercolors that you're looking at. And, and what I want you to notice is the power of color. When I'm sitting in a place, um, I like colors to overwhelm my senses where my, all of my thoughts go away and I try to use, reduce the colors of a particular landscape into a, a color palette that represents um, a time of day, a season and place. And so for me, it's about that um, collection of um, collecting colors in that, trying to distill that into a painting really makes me be in that moment and feel a place. And so I really paint to be I guess almost like a meditation, I, I would say. So I have spent the past 30 years using color to explore natural habitats. Now, of course, while I'm sitting there, I'm always on location. I, I do watercolor because it allows me to be on location very easily. And I've discovered that wetlands are my place, largely because the place that you just entered into in this video I showed you, Lee Tart Nature Preserve is three blocks from my studio, which is where I'm sitting. I'm sitting inside my studio tonight to do this presentation. So this is a place I go every day. Um, I moved to the town I live in, Grenada, um, 25 years ago, right out of college. And um, I probably, I, I loved plants. I mean, I was in the Native Plant Society as a teenager, but I can't, I think I was paying more attention to flowers and maybe, um, you know, I guess the pretty plants, the things that would grow um, maybe on the roadsides. I had not thought a lot about trees or wild forest or habitats because I grew up in the city and I did not know about that. So when I moved to Grenada and I found this big wetland, it became this magical realm and my teacher. It should, you know, and I used color to enter into that realm and feel peaceful. I never felt scared to go. Maybe I should have felt scared. But the second I would sit down and get out my paints, color is a language that I use so fluently that it felt familiar. And I could begin to see where I was um, much better. And I did that day in and day out. So 
one of the things that, um, and I, one of the things that I, I'm going to show y'all is kind of, I have a feeling that we all have different ways of doing this. I think gardening is another way of, of entering into a natural world and maybe feeling at ease, learning to collect seeds and things like that. But for me, it's sitting down and just painting to pay attention. And so here's a quick little sketch of a cypress tree. I'm sitting on a deck out at Lee Tart Nature Preserve. And what I'm seeing with my eyes, I'm kind of showing y'all a little bit about what I'm seeing. Um, I also love to take pictures of what's around me. Um, and my mind becomes curious. My painting may not show all that I'm seeing, I guess is what I'm saying, but because I'm sitting down, paying attention, and kind of like the pals, pay attention, look. My mother corrected me. She told me my English was wrong. So I was like, look slowly is what, what that should be. Um, uh, that has become a very important part of my process. So even if it doesn't get in the painting, it's in my heart and my mind. And so around the cypress tree, of course, our knees. This was the first tree I really learned because it's so distinctive with its big buttresses and its, and its roots that grow up with these growths. And uh, even this, uh, this um, people come and take the cypress knees sometimes out of this area and I'll find them and they've healed themselves. And I've, I'm just fascinated by that color. And uh, this time of year, the cypress always had this new growth on them that's so bright red. And the fact that it could heal itself, uh, I'm just kind of showing y'all where my mind uh, goes. And the first time I saw cones on a cypress tree, I was just amazed that that's what a uh, deciduous conifer looked like. And um, it does not take much to get me excited. I'm, I think I'm talking to my people tonight, though. So maybe that kind of thing gets y'all excited, too. And then when I saw my first baby cypress, I mean, I remember that that moment. It was probably like 20 years ago. I mean, I just had, I wasn't even trying to see a baby cypress. I'm down in the dirt painting. I always sit on the forest floor to paint. And there I saw it emerging. And probably this was pre-internet. And I would just go to the library and read up on everything. And I learned that cypress trees only germinate in dry land. I just, you know, I don't think about those things. This is before I could think about habitat. I wasn't I wasn't understanding ecology yet, you know, is that 20 years ago, but this is, these are the sorts of moments that made me want, I wanted to know like, oh, what is this? And, and why is it germinating here? You know, Cyprus, uh, Cyprus have to germinate in a moist soil, but if, if the water doesn't draw down in the fall, uh, they're not going to germinate or in the summer and so are in the spring. So, you know, wetlands are going to have this fluctuation and that's very important for having. Um, and then those sorts of things made me begin to see the living system I was sitting in, not just a collection of trees or a place that I painted. Um, and then, oh, my new obsession, my obsession of 20 years ago happened when I began to see things like this on trees and the ones on Cypress are extra cool. But this is a type of gall. And if y'all ever see weird growths on trees, um, some insect has um, you know, chemically altered that tree's DNA to grow it basically a little nursery. I mean, that's just fascinating. And um, anyway, I could go on and on about cypress trees, but y'all see how my mind, these are the sorts of things as color led me to be a painting and painting led me to observe and observing led me to ask questions, which led me to understand ecology and seek it out. So Plants inevitably, um, you know, lead me to other things. I, I definitely started with plants, but you can't stay, you know, if you stay with plants long enough, you're going to eventually get to birds. And so certainly if you're in a wetland and these big wading birds, this is a, a great egret, um, are some of the easiest to really observe because they will quietly stand and they look. And if you notice their white, bold color, I mean, back to kind of colors again, um, when I'm painting, I paint on location. So I'm showing you all a little sketch I did at twilight. I saw all those birds roosting for the night and all I could see were their white shapes in the darkening forest around me. And I'm just using color and the, the dark neutrals and their, their color to kind of capture that moment and really just burn it into my memory. So, and then I go into the studio and play with some of these ideas that I see the, uh, the snakes and the fish that I know the egret are looking for. And so another thing, I think we were talking about this earlier, um, monarchs have uh, become, I think, just sort of a popular, I, you know, all the garden club ladies that, that I talk to, I'm, I'm good friends with many of them, and many of you may be in a garden club. Monarchs are kind of like that gateway, that gateway mm. natural creature, certainly insect, it helps people understand ecology. They get into milkweed. And um, the first time I realized we had a native milkweed, which this is Asclepius perennis at Lee Tart Nature Preserve. I mean, I thought this is kind of that, that one spring I was walking in a wet ditch when I, 
I mostly ignore ditches. I go into these beautiful areas um, with all the big cypress trees, but I decided to explore a ditch right beside the road. It was absolutely covered in Asclepius perennis and every stalk had a monarch on it. I couldn't believe it. And um, so, and I knew better, I know to look in ditches. But anyway, that moment, I spent every day that spring uh, running out, watching the monarchs, watching the chrysalises form, and ultimately sitting down. I, I had so many people stop and ask me if okay, I was okay. I'm down in this ditch with my chair, with my boots on, sitting in the water, uh, painting Asclepius perennis. And uh, I think the police were called. They came to check on me. <laughs> but I'm that crazy lady that really wants to look at plants and their relationships at that level. But it's really the colors are drawing me in. And, and you can see my use of color as a language to try to really I simplify forms to try to understand their structures better. And I'm going to show you all a little bit of a close up of my painting because I, I do kind of want to understand when I'm painting, it's truly about looking at colors in front of me and interpreting that color in a way that Re, you know, distills what I think is most important. And it doesn't, you can try this, not even have to be a painter. You don't have to make a great painting. It's about looking at a color and then translating it into paint. And I've done that for many, many years, and which has, um, but it, which has made me better at it, where I can use it as a, like a language. But the translation of what you see, whether it's a pattern or a color onto a piece of paper, it's amazing where that will take your mind and it will allow you to look at something or connect with something in a way that I just don't know if it's possible in any other way. Um, <clears throat> of course, the same thing could be said of eating. Like you could take a pear and see it growing on a tree and then take it inside and cook it in with a little bit of butter and put that on top of a pastry and that pear becomes something new. And through our creativity, we do things like that. So um, how am I doing on time? I feel like I'm going too long. Um, no, you're doing fine. Okay, okay. Well, you don't know how many more slides I've got. So. My observations, you know, this is all about kind of my experience that I've talked about so far. But as I've, the more I learned about ecology and I've made these connections with say, certainly the monarch was an entry for me too. I became a master naturalist in 2007. And if you ever have a chance to take a master naturalist program, I would really encourage you because it will, it will and especially if y'all already understand native plants, it will be easy for you to then understand stand habitat and all the other things, the water systems and uh, fire and all the things that go into um, to ecology. Anyway, I did that in 2007 and I tell everybody that gave me a new superpower. And I really began to see that color is a language that I don't, I'm not the only one that, that understands it as a language. It, it, nature has been doing that for millions of years and plants are the best users of color. So I'm sure, you know, y'all might know exactly where I'm going with this as native plant people. Um, and, and I feel like I don't even need to tell you everything, but just in case y'all are newbies, this is a jewel weed. It's one of our impatiens and it is, um, it is definitely a, a wetland species. And it's, um, it starts coming up in, it really starts blooming for me in the, in the late summer or the high summer on into the fall. <clears throat> so here we have red buckeye. Um, this will kind of grow, this grows in our swamp as well. Our swamp kind of has a little hilly area and we're in the Lurse Bluff. So we get this plant and this is coming up in the spring, um, right about migration, hint, hint. And so here we have cardinal flower that's uh, blooming in the fall. You notice all of these are in high contrast to a green background. These are reds and oranges. And so plants are very savvy and crafty. And a lot of people probably just think plants are passive, but I think we all know better. We know they have spent millions of years becoming the best billboards ever to get their job done. They can't move, so they have to bring things to themselves. And this is, I mean, this is, because if I sit and paint, I love to paint cardinal flower in particular, and the insects go crazy over it. But if you sit there long enough, you're gonna see hummingbird. And those three plants we just looked at you know, they are in rhythm with migration. They're all opening, whether it's spring migration or fall migration, and they are a big old build. I feel certain a hummingbird can see them from a long way away because they have, they are a color that stands out amongst the green. And I can't help but want to bring up this craftiness about a plant. And I don't know if y'all have ever looked at cardinal flower up close. Every flower has, you know, they're wily. They're trying to get them, themselves pollinated. 
And so what I find this, this, I took this picture with my cell phone, so it's a little blurry, but it just so happens that as a hummingbird is putting its beak down into, I wish I had learned how to actually use the little, um, I, or Karen, can you tell me an easy way that I can like have a pointer? Oh, I think you can just use their mouse pointer. I can use my mouse pointer. Yes. If I click like, no, oh, it's pointing. You're is pointing. it pointing? Like y'all yeah. can see some, when I click, y'all can see something there. Yeah, I can see your pointer. Okay. Um, okay, well, cool. Well, this little thing up here, when, when the, when the um, hummingbird goes in, his head is hitting, you know, the pollen up here. Then he comes over to the next one and so on and so forth. And they're pollinating uh, the cardinal flower. And I just find that fascinating that they've using color. And this is an exact height for a, a hummingbird head. And I never really noticed, I had to have someone point this out to me that the flower was structured in that way. And those are the things that get me. So it made me start looking at all flowers and maybe questioning a little bit more about how they're being pollinated. You know, when they're blooming, witch hazel fascinates me. I mean, it's blooming in November and December. You know, who's pollinating it? I, I have to Google it immediately when I think of these things. Um, hang on, what am I doing here? Okay, and here's another one. I'm gonna kind of go quick through him so I can kind of move on a little bit, but you get, you guys get my point. I mean, trumpet creepers, I mean, they're using color and these like directional lines telling the bumblebee and the hummingbird exactly where they want them to go. And they've put their pollen up here at the top. Once again, they are perfectly sized in shapes for bumblebees and, um, and hummingbirds. And so, one of the things I also want to show, I'm so fascinated by this. I mean, this just blows my mind that nature, um, that there's actually plants have such a plan going on that I've done a series of illustrations using leaves and flower petals and the color, the mineral colors that I find at the swamp. And so you're looking at, I used poke leaves, um, bitterweed petals and a red iron oxide dirt to create this image and some charcoal. And it, it, I did a series of 12 and they're telling a little story. So this is telling the, the story um, of, uh, of, of that, of, of basically what I just described. And um, I'm just trying to get, you know, I sell these as note cards and a lot of people buy them and I have a story written on the back. And so I am just trying any way I can to get people interested in native plants. And, and I think the, the, the ecological connections are one of those ways. Um, <clears throat> And so here I'm going to use color to kind of make a point about human nature. And I, I when people come on field trips at Leith Heart Nature Preserve, I use this one a lot. I think I saw this plant for years. And what I mean by pl the plant that's floating in the water is something that I just assumed I knew those were some, I don't know what I thought, dead algae. Or I, I just kind of looked past it because it was just some some reddish brown color in the water. And I'm looking more at the moss on the tree because that's a pretty color to me. But I became a kayaker about 10 or 12 years ago. And when you get down on eye level, this is what perspective can do. And you begin, I made a connection. I looked down in the water for my kayak and I realized that rusty red color was a, a well, I didn't know what it was at the time, but I've since learned that it is a, a the smallest fern on earth. It is a, this, there's, or this family of ferns, it's an aquatic fern known as mosquito fern. And um, I did learn that I think it's called mosquito fern because it will grow across the surface of the water and prevent mosquitoes from laying their eggs. That's what I read anyway. But I assumed that was some algae or some dead stuff and just, and just didn't even examine it until I actually got down in the water with my kayak. So how many other plants, how many other species am I assuming I can see and understand and dismiss? And I think that's kind of your average person dismisses native plants and most things, certainly on our roadsides, we're watching them getting sprayed and cut. I'm sure y'all y'all understand. So I think it's very important to find ways to take closer looks, which is why I think creativity can enter the picture. And of course, and I encourage people to kayak as well or gain a new perspective, but sometimes sitting down to paint or draw or getting in a kayak will give you that slow down and pay attention kind of moment. So here's another moment and I can't help but share a quick story. So um, I've been kayaking now for a couple of years and, and I'm looking at, you know, this is a typical, sh the sheen on a swamp we call swamp scum and it always gets on my stuff. And one day I'm out painting and uh, I'm, I'm proud of my painting. I'm painting like a cypress tree and the wind picks up my painting, blows it in the water and when I pick up that painting, it is covered in um, 
this this brown goo that's on the surface and but that was an aha that that particular moment really changed everything because this is prior to me using forged pigments this was the, the very beginning of me realizing that nature had pigments all you know that I could interact with I, it was just stuff I, nature was something I was looking at up to this point this was like 15 years ago so I've become obsessed since then with dipping watercolor paper into the surface and and pulling up these beautiful brown tones different times of year or different you're you know basically I realized you know and I really I didn't ever thought about it I mean what's on the surface of a swamp are the decomposed leaves the oils in the plant rise to the surface and float and then it's the pollen collects on top of that and um and so you're dealing with sort of literally all the things that are living in the swamp and uh, reduced to this oily substance and uh, of course you get dragonfly wings caught in there it's almost like a petri dish and i've learned you can interact with this but you can make it those are my fingers i love to to tap my fingers, my wet fingers onto the paper and it will create a resist. So when I pull it across the oily surface, um, you know, it creates this pattern. So I love to play, look, when I go out to paint, sometimes I'll use up all my paper doing this because it is so entertaining. Um, but it really does help me slow down and get into that creative zone um, where I'm then ready to paint. And, um, and I would encourage if y'all just do nothing else, next time you see a puddle of water that might have a sheen on it where, where leaves would be decomposing or you're in a swamp, just dip something in it. It is so fun. It will bring out the child in you, I promise. And if you do introduce this to a child, they will, well, I don't know if they'll be as, they, they, of course they will love it. Maybe they'll rub it all over them. But uh, so I'm going to kind of, uh, I'm going to try to speed up a little bit here. So another moment for me also, we did a controlled burn and right after that master naturalist course. And I don't know if y'all can see this little cardinal down here. A bunch of cardinals flew in the moment that burn, it started raining during the burn and cardinals flew in and immediately began to eat. And I was like, oh my gosh, prescribed burns have, have created this. All of a sudden the birds are coming in and they have, they can easily access their food. And I was just uh, transfixed. But then I realized I was looking at this amazing black color. And so I, I, I started rubbing it onto the paper and, um, and the rain was pat spattering on it, making this texture. And I let it dry when I got home and I cut out cardinals and put another piece of paper that was the red iron oxide paper. And um, that was maybe one of my first collages that I did in layers. And so, um, y'all, sometimes the color is the segue in this, all this orange color, this orange just gets to me. So I, I couldn't find any other way to make this slide connect with that one. And, uh, but um, anyway, the orange, once again, is something that stands out in nature. And um, I don't know if y'all, these are chanterelles. And I did not know what a chanterelle was till maybe four or five years ago. And I'm certain I saw, they were growing near me or around me, so, but somehow I could just not see them. I don't know. Um, but this is a forager friend of mine who's actually telling me about chanterelles and, and encouraging me to collect them. We, we went and ate them later that evening. It was my first time to try them. But um, the color is really what drew me in on the, you know, to, to make me look at them closer. And I see their distinct shape. And he gave me the courage to realize that they had a very distinct shape. And as an artist, I understood that I could, you know, identify something that I could eat and not feel scared. And so at this point, and this was just a few years ago, I, I, I started trying to explore the pigments and everything I found. I just, I got, I went through when I first, you know, from the moment that I dipped that paper in the water and realizing that, wow, there are pigments all around me directly in nature, not just in a tube from the store. I begin to fill my sketchbooks with, look, like, even from every algae on the deck. This is no special paper either. This is just like, you can see my sketch through another side. This is probably another mushroom. Um, just having fun storing these ideas. And I take these ideas into my studio and then make these collages. This, this is a several layers of paper that I cut holes. This is just the forest floor that I've rubbed into the paper. I think I've traced around a, I think that's a lizard's tail leaf. And um, then I, you know, I was thinking of the chanterelle shape and decomposing logs. And I love decomposition. I love to watch the body of a tree fall into the forest floor and slowly become soil and all the funguses and all the things that happen around it. Um, I could, I think I've put way too many mushrooms in here. So I'm just kind of keep going through that. Once again, this was inspired by that, by that green rusula. 
And I think I rubbed a bolete mushroom across the paper here, whoops, across the paper here, and uh, then used soil from the forest floor and created layers. And that, to me, I'm always trying to show how the forest floor makes me feel. This represents the forest floor. You know, little berries. I think I was thinking of maybe partridge uh, berry, and maybe I don't. You know, I, I can't. It, it's not always supposed to be literal. Sometimes it's just supposed to be maybe holes being eaten in leaves or um, branches and, and just layers. And so I just threw that in there too, to show y'all just more obsession with mushrooms and the strong use of color that is inspired by funguses. And so um, I, I want to wrap it back up to though, it's not just about human perception because we certainly have amazing eyes that can see so many colors. I mean, I think I read somewhere that we can see a, a well over a million colors and some people can see 10 million colors. And, um, but this little fella, cause I'm thinking, I'm often asking myself, why do funguses have such bright colors? And I actually don't know the answer. And if someone out there listening knows more about funguses, I would love for y'all to tell me in a little while about the colors on fungus. But I have personally witnessed Mr. Box Turtle eating, um, eating uh, mushrooms. And I, I know he's crawling around on the forest floor. You know, he can probably barely see things that are very tall. So I can only imagine that those brightly colored mushrooms really help him find where, where, where he needs to be to get a nice meal. So here's another um, one of my uh, illustrations with another series of, um, I'm using natural colors, the same, basically the same palette as the hummingbird ones with the red iron oxide on the owl. And then I've got the pipe vine and the pipe vine swallowtail. And I have a little story that goes with this. And of course, I'm talking about the, the, the owls looking for a snack here in my story. And uh, of course, we all know the butterfly, the caterpillar only eats this particular vine. So I have my hole here. But um, <clears throat> this plant to me was just one of, the, like one of those first plants that I really began to differentiate vines. I would say about 12 or 14 years ago, I'm, I just thought we had a few vines and I'm looking around the forest and in the spring. And I think I've looked past this vine a thousand times, assuming it was a grape or just not seeing it at all. Like I think so many people just don't see, it's just a green thing growing. But I saw this. And I was like, oh my, what is that? And I, you know, I realized it was the flower, but um, that flower was so unusual and so unexpected. It really got to me. And the leaves were so furry and big. This is woolly pipe vine. Anyway, I've, it's come to be one of my favorite plants and I've explored it here with mud and a, and a leaf print. Y'all, anybody can do this. Put some paint on a leaf, slap it down on a piece of paper and rub dirt across it. And it's amazing the fun results you can get with that. And of course, here's the actual pipe vine uh, swallowtail in my hand and I'm just, I'm fascinated with, I have absolutely no idea why these beautiful and amazing bold colors are on this butterfly. And I feel certain it has, it, it is functional for this butterfly. It's not just so I can enjoy its beauty, but I am so glad to be a human so that I can. Um, once again, if someone can tell me more about why a pipe vine swallowtail has such amazing colorations, I would love to know. Um, and, <clears throat> I can't, I couldn't help but just throw this slide in. I, when I look at a yellow poplar, I like to introduce this plant to people and I know y'all know this plant, um, but it just reminds me of a butterfly and that orange and just the way the ribs are. I think of it as just a flower, a flower form of butterfly. And so I always think about it this time of year. And then once again, it's that orange color, that orange and the butterfly and the flower and the mushroom, um, that color is just, you know, that safety orange is just so amazing. I mean, we use it too to be seen in the forest. So I feel certain there's something to that orange wanting to be you know, seen. So I'm fixing to kind of transition a little bit, but before I transition and this is kind of a transition slide. And um, this is one of the first birds I ever learned. This is the pathonotary warbler. It's unique to wetlands. It's considered a threatened species. And it was one of the first birds I've learned. And I mean, in the past, maybe 10 or 12 years, I'm sure because it's so bright, I couldn't help but notice it. And I started asking my bird friends and they're telling me, oh, well, that's a pathonotary warbler. And it's so easy to identify it with its both sound and, and color. It's one that I've just really enjoyed learning about. And I can't help but share with y'all because um, I don't know if any of y'all have gone down the bird, uh, gotten into birds because of plants, but I have learned through this bird how important oak trees are in particular. I don't know if y'all know Douglas Ptolemy. He's an entomologist that's desperately trying to get people to see the connection between um, 
native, they want that he wants to make sure people understand caterpillars need native plants. And who needs caterpillars or songbirds. And so you have to have a lot, particularly oaks, you know, he really pushes oaks, but native, you, you want eaten up plants so you can have these caterpillars. And what he, when I, I heard Douglas talk and he, and he talked about a, uh, a family, you know, a, 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 a pair of birds needing um, 10,000 caterpillars to raise three babies. And that blew my mind. Think of the amount of plants that you're going to have to have to support 10,000 caterpillars in the course of two weeks. And so that makes it just ever more important to have these native plants in our yard. And certainly if you want to see these animals. So the thing that actually makes these uh, warblers particularly unique is they need a, 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 a cavity in a tree. They're the only cavity dwelling warbler. So the reason they're threatened is over other birds is when they go in to try to find a place to nest, they're already coming in and they can't build their own cavity. They have to find a cavity that a woodpecker and a squirrel and a wood duck and a flying, you know, that, that, that's not already inhabited and they can't create their own. And so they're coming in on the, on, you know, with in, in April and May and looking for that and they struggle. They're struggling so hard to find a place to nest now because we cut the mature trees that are going to rot. They like cypress trees in particular and they like to nest over the water. So this is everything to do with, uh, you know, our, our, uh, our wetlands and having mature wetlands available to them. Um, and here's my, my illustration as a part of that series. Um, I did a series where all these images connect into one big cypress tree. And I think I'm going to, I have the image to show y'all in a little while when I, when I um, get back to where y'all can see me. Um, but uh, I'm sure y'all all know this plant, but this is cross vine. And I, you know, I, and I love talking to native plant people, like I keep saying, because I usually feel the need to, you know, have to really explain the plant. This is cross vine and a damselfly. And this bird, these birds are knowing for the male feeding the female while she's on the nest. So this leads me to the conservation component. So I've kind of been doing this kind of alone artist thing, showing my work, um, trying to get people to see nature, love it, connect to it. And that's a very limited audience, getting people to come to art shows or maybe giving workshops. And I knew in my heart I wasn't reaching enough people and I did not know what to do about that. But it's kind of interesting when you put a prayer in your heart, how it can be answered in ways that you have no idea. I didn't know I had no idea what what I was asking, uh, what I was asking when I began to put that prayer in my heart. But um, so color is a language that connects and. This wetland that I've been going to, uh, that's now called Lee Tart Nature Preserve, um, it's our city owns it. And our city allowed me to begin to care for it and build trails in it back, I would say 2009. And so I began to bring garden clubs out, school groups out, um, church groups, anybody I could get to, to bring out and we would begin to go on walks and do activities. And so, you know, there's nothing like color or asking kids to look out and, and see if they can see something. The first thing they're going to go for is something they can, something bright. And uh, whether it's in the water or on the tree. Um, and so here, these are just a few pictures here. Um, I'd invited the student to go out and collect five colors, you know, in about 15 minutes. And then we all sat in a circle and we're just playing. We're not trying to make pictures. We're just experimenting with colors like I was doing earlier. We have the Girl Scout troop here. I had them sit around one of these oily puddles in the spring where the leaves had been decaying. And so they're playing with the violets that are growing around and they're, they're using their hand as a stencil to be showing their connection to that place. And so around their hand, they're making all, they're, that's kind of really also to keep it white, but they, they will begin to, they loved putting their hand down and rubbing dirt across it and dipping it in the mud. Uh, I, I don't know how, how much these mother, the mothers were got down there with them. I'm going to tell you, it was, it was really fun to see. Another time we just, I just invited everyone to go off on a walk and collect some dirt and bring it back. And we put it all in a pile and look at all the variety just from one location. And of course, then we did turn that into, we mixed it with water and began to paint with it. But these are the kind of things that help people, I think, begin to really look at where they are and realize that just because you're in one place doesn't mean the dirt's not all the same. And why is that? You know, maybe some has organic areas. Maybe there's a river near some, you know, some of the dirt. Maybe some has sand. So it leads to so many questions. I'm a big fan of questions over answers. 
And when here I am, I just let a bunch of young people roll out. We rolled out a giant piece of paper and I'm letting them just paint with red iron oxide that I dug out of a ditch. And we, this is teenagers. So these are 14, 15 years old. And I never thought they just started rubbing their whole body on it. It was a lot of fun. And just a nature walk, you know, walking and invite, giving people a blank piece of paper, inviting them to just make colors. This little girl wanted to know every plant and wanted to, I think she's a future scientist. She wanted to know what everything was and writing it down on top of her color. So y'all saw me use this. Um, I think this is our day. This, I think this is the Asian day flower, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we have the white throated day flower and the Asian day flower that grow together at the swamp. And I will, I must admit that the Asian version has a much nicer color. But um, it's one of those invasive plants or, or, or I guess exotic plants that don't bother me as much as others. So um, I don't even try to eradicate it. Plus it makes such a nice color. So y'all kind of already seen me use this in that video to understand that, you know, just you can directly take petals and just rub them straight into paper, voila. And it's as, as beautiful as anything you can get in a, uh, you know, in a paint box. Now the downside is, plant pigments are unstable and these will change over time, maybe fade or turn to brown within weeks. But that's kind of cool too, because you can really think about those living pigments um, being chemicals and changing with oxygen or with air or with time. And let that just be another way to think about um, nature and plants and um, just the overall, how, how things are supposed to change and not stay the same. Yeah, I don't know if y'all can hear my dog and I apologize if you can. I locked him up and he's not happy. Um, so, and this is, uh, of course, pokeweed. Y'all saw me use it in the video and it's another favorite. Uh, it's just a favorite plant for every reason, largely because most people cannot wait to weed eat it and pull it out of their garden. And it is to me one of the most beautiful colored stalks. It's got these amazing berries and the leaves are my favorite to use for colors, but it just looks so tropical. And so when I work with groups, this is, these are actually elderberries that we're crushing. My backyard is mostly pokeberries and elderberries. I've just got tons of them growing and I collect them um, when they're in, in, in getting ripe and, and freeze them so I can use them in workshops. And here, you know, I've just been playing around. You can lay flowers down in, um, into these, uh, you know, inks may, I'm gonna call these inks, these uh, crushed berries and just let, let it dry like that for a day or two. And then when you pull the flower out, you're left with its impression. And it's interesting how elderberry, I don't know if y'all have ever played with elderberry, when it's exposed to, to water, or I've put, this is clay up here. I put a white clay that I found mixed in with it. It turns it blue. You can just begin, I don't know anything about chemistry. I know pH changes things. But you can have a whole lot of fun just thinking about um, colors and the landscape and um, just time in general. So this is the very last section of my presentation. And this is more directly about the organization um, that I uh, formed called Friends of Chachuma Swamp. And I like to start with this slide. If, I don't know if you've ever been to Grenada. This is I-55 that goes right up to Memphis. And this is Grenada where, I, can y'all see my little, can you, Karen, can you see my, my arrow? You're doing fine. Okay. Um, this is Grenada. We have the largest lake in Mississippi. It's a man-made reservoir. And Lee Tart Nature Preserve is right here, right below it. It's, our, it's a big wetland. The, uh, it's part of the floodplain of the Yalabusha River that flows into the Yazoo here into, this is the Mississippi Delta. And so what I want, what I, you know, color is one of those, you know, map, in a map, color can be very interesting. When you look at the Mississippi Delta, uh, one of the largest um, floodplains in North America, and you see this light color, you know, we all know what that means. It's been denuded and become agricultural lands. And here up in the hills, which is where I live in the Lurse Bluffs, a very interesting place botanically. Um, we are we are right here, and um, in this, and I'm in this floodplain that flows into this large area. And I have been very aware. I went to school here in Cleveland, and so I I know what should be here. And the older I get, and the more I study ecology, the more I'm aware of what should be there. When I'm down inside one of these areas, like Lee Tart Nature Preserve, all the images y'all have been seeing have come from this small area right here, Lee Tart Nature Preserve. It's a vast universe when you're in one of these little pockets, but from the air, you really realize how much is gone, but there's less than 2% left of a forested cover in the Mississippi Alluvial Valley. 
And so I know how special it is to just have this one little segment. And this area happens to be uh, connect. This is a core of engineer land. And so we're near a lot of protected land. And here we're in our downtown area. So Lee Tart Nature Preserve is just across the bridge from our residential and historic part of our town. So one of the most exciting parts about that is I can get people to come there. And so um, even uh, so what happens about in 2009 is I was able to get our downtown association to collect up a bunch of people who thought it was a cool idea to do some trails uh, out in this area and we began taking people out there like I was saying. Well I'm going to tell y'all a real quick story that's just kind of led me to how did, how did I really become I probably would have never had the courage to be an activist. I, I heard Karen use that word with me <laughs> because you know being an activist takes a lot of time and, and a lot of courage to try to get people to, and to me, an activism means you're trying to change the way someone sees something and the way maybe even physically protect it. Um, I knew I wanted this place protected, but I thought asking the city you know, to allow me to put trails in was good enough. But in 2016, I went out there one day, they had timber harvest ribbons around the entire property. And I found out later that they were gonna cut all city properties. Um, that fall, they were putting the bids out. And this is, y'all, this is a, if y'all can see, this is a very special place to me. And so um, I couldn't let that happen. So what ended up happening, I don't know if y'all can see this little tag. I had this idea. I talked to everybody I could think of. And I ended up realizing that a tree like this might only have a market value of $75 to $100. And that blew my mind that a 60 or 70 year old tree might only be valued at 60 to hundred dollars. And I thought, wow, if I could just sell these trees to people that would love them. And I'm like, oh, maybe I can sell these trees, you know? So I, anyway, the city, the city humored me, allowed me to, they dropped the first timber bid largely because they didn't get enough high bids. They allowed me to begin to sell these trees. And the way we did that, oh, okay. I've actually thought my next slide was gonna be another slide. I should have kept going. So this is kind of, y'all hold, hold that thought. Here's what our swamp looks like, Chakchuma Swamp looks like um, when you're on the very edge. We've got an amazing bottomland forest. We've got a lot of river cane wanting to come in. We're actually trying to do some work to make it thrive. We got um, Simplocos tinctora, a lot of sweet leaf that ring it, lots of pawpaws. I could just almost call this pawpaw swamp. Our understory is amazing. And I knew what would happen to that understory if we had the kind of cut they were suggesting. And I knew how I felt about it all. And I knew how many people came here and would and could come here if it was able to remain. So in, in some moment, I didn't even think about it. I, I didn't one day say, well, gosh, I'm going to be an activist. I just started doing stuff. I started going to city council meetings. I did this painting to try to show them the interior of the forest. I told people if they bought a tree, I would give them a print of this painting. And so... The way we did that is we talked to our, uh, we have a forestry program at our local community college. Uh, we got some of the good students to come out, cruise the forest like they were going to cruise it for a timber sale. But instead, we had them, you know, we actually made a database where they were collecting the uh, DBH and the height. They would get, take the tree species down and geolocate it on their cell phones. And so we had that kind of database. So when people adopted a tree, they actually adopted an actual tree. We put these tags on there with a number. And so as people begin to give us $50, $100, $200, we would send them a package about what tree they adopted, what tree they were saving, inviting them to come visit it. And I would give them one of those prints. And so um, here's kind of what that looks like up close. And so that way they would know they were at the tree and we, we originally put ribbons on so they would and, and name the tree species. And <clears throat> we were able to get 300 people to do that um, pretty quickly, and, but it wasn't good enough. And I will tell you, we got a new city manager. I can make this story very long and involved, but I'm gonna kind of sum it up by saying, I never gave up and I just kept going. And I guess that that makes me an activist. Um, I, I, could, I can just say, you just don't give up. And I kept painting, I kept bringing people out there, kept adopting trees. And some, a foundation heard about us um, and ended up, they did two things. They almost, without me even knowing they were going to do this, came to Grenada, looked at the situation, met the city and became the high bidder on, this, on the set. They, they rebid the timber a second time. And they gave me eight weeks to raise $300,000. 
And I mean, I was trying as hard as I could. And I knew that um, I, I originally thought they might back down and let me do it over time. But the new city manager really pushed the issue. He needed the money. He needed the money. And I knew he needed the money. But, you know, I was trying. But anyway, this foundation came in, loaned us the $300,000 um, and became friends with the city. The city liked you know, the, the guy was able to really talk to the city manager. We were, I was not in a good relationship with the city at this point. And so all that to say is it's not always the, it's not the money. The money stopped the timber sale, but without a good relationship with the city, this could not have worked because the city would not have accepted this crazy plan. And the plan was this, they took the $300,000 and what we ended up doing, we ended up winning awards off of this. So I went ahead and, and, and changed this, but we um, we decided that to make this secure for the forest, we would get a 60 year lease put onto the property. Well, I didn't want to hold that lease. I wasn't in a position to, I didn't have a 501c3. And I ran around trying to get everybody in the world to hold the lease like land trust. And anyway, just I just couldn't find a way to make it work or anyone who would accept that. So in the end, I just decided, well, I guess I'm going to have to form a 501c3. But I had met a lot of people who really helped, and we formed a, uh, a, a an amazing board came together. And, um, and so in 2018, we incorporated into that. And um, now we are the managers of 300 acres. And <laughs> we are called, we are friends of Chuck Chuma Swamp because we've been a friends group since 2009, but now we've incorporated. And I can't help but be an art. I mean, I'm an artist that's running a conservation nonprofit. And so now I finally have this platform. And of course, conservation is our mission. But let's just go back to kind of the beginning of this presentation, where it's really about community. It's about getting people outside, because we all know people are scared. And I think native plants are one of the most powerful tools to get people unscared, because a lot of people, I could understand their fear of a spider or a reptile, but if you can just invite them in with a plant, that just seems interesting. Of course, not everybody thinks a plant is fascinating like me, but sometimes you can say, ooh, look at this bird coming to the plant. It's kind of about that connection. But you're, you know, I want to build community around nature. And having people enjoy uh, spending time together, uh, unscared, not, you know, not necessarily partying down with their beer and their loud music, but being actually in a place. So to me, that kind of connection comes from creativity and curiosity. That's to me kind of the premise of our mission. So this is my board. And we've pretty much been together since 2018 when we had to kind of pull ourselves together. And I've got everybody from garden club people, to school teachers, to to people who have logging companies and nurse practitioners. I got a priest in there and a librarian. So we kind of are, uh, represent kind of the community and we are doing our best um, to uh, take care of this place that is so special and learning a whole lot. We're on a big learning curve. And if y'all really wanna know more, I could tell you a whole story about how we became Lee Tart Nature Preserve instead of Chuck Chuma Swamp Natural Area, which is what we used to be called. But, um, I feel like y'all can go to our website and maybe learn a little bit more. The trade, the, 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 the found, I will just say the foundation that uh, helped us out requested this name. And Lee Tart is a fascinating person in and of himself. So um, I'll leave y'all kind of with that to, to explore on your own. Um, I, of course, use my skills as an artist to try to create maps and things that show people uh, interacting with nature. This is kind of to encourage people to go out and use our trails. We go and do activities in our local festivals all the time. This is us at our local festival uh, inviting, we'll have big tables of all these natural pigments for people to play with. And if we do nothing else, or I do nothing else with my life and my time as an artist and uh, as an activist, it is, I really would love to leave y'all tonight and everybody I come in contact with to really understand that everything is connected. Everything, you know, whether it's uh, something you're trying to save or just something you know, something in nature when you're looking at ecology, and then you can always choose to be a part of that connection. And to me, that's also the biggest anxiety reducer I can ever have is when I connect to something, particularly a plant, I immediately feel better. Um, so with that, that's the end of my presentation. And uh, I'm gonna try to find a way to get back to y'all. Let's see here. Oh, I'm sure we have some questions along okay. the way. Can y'all um, see me? 
Yes. Okay. And I apologize if that went on kind of long. I knew I would. <laughs> Thank y'all for hanging in there with me. Um, I did post the uh, link in the video, uh, the okay. video link. So it's in the chat. Anybody who wants to can copy it down. Excellent. Um, and we're our friend. I've meant to add this in our, our, the website for our organization is friends dash C of dash cs.org we knew that no one would be able to spell chakchuma and if y'all are curious at this point i know somebody may be asking so what is chakchuma why, why that you know i will tell y'all so when we first when i first asked the city about this pro i was like you know what what is this property y'all have over there and they're like oh you mean old dump lake and i'm like what what wait you call that dump lake and so I, that was unacceptable to me. And so I invited the community to offer some more names for this, you know, beautiful wetland to change our view of it. And because it really was dump lake, that's where people went to dump and, and uh, there weren't gates up and they were actively dumping. But um, Chakchuma were the native tribe of people who lived in our area. They lived right there along the Alabusha. And we had a bunch of historical people decide that was a good name. And they, they and we thought so, too. So, you know, we didn't know it was going to be so hard to say when you look. It's not hard to say, but when you look at it, it can be confusing. But it means red crawfish people. They were the red crawfish people before the Choctaw mm. were uh, ran them off. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so that's how we, we got our name. And um, so are there, are there questions? Well, there were questions about the Master Naturalist program. Um, apparently you can Google it uh, for Mississippi. And Tennessee, I'm trying to remember. I'm pretty sure y'all have one, but I could be. Oh, I know, I know I, we have one. <laughs> oh, excellent. Um, I know uh, this, that. This I'm not, fella I'm here not. was one of the initial uh, <laughs> present, initial uh, uh, members of them. There are oh, 11 okay. different sites where you can do the Tennessee Naturalist, different state parks. And um, right. um, yeah, so it's. Um, it's been expanding. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big. Um, um, there are many opportunities for Tennessee. Yeah, and I hope y'all's is as good as ours. Ours, um, I did mine through Audubon at the Strawberry Plains Audubon Center in Memphis. And lots of Memphis people come to that one. And um, but they have not been doing it. Uh, they have not done it since 2019. And they didn't do it during COVID. And they've um, downsized their education department. So I hope that they bring it back. Um, if they don't, guess what? I'm going to bring it back in a couple of years. So we're, we're, we're currently trying to purchase a, a facility. There's an old metal building uh, on one acre that is adjacent to Lee Tart Nature Preserve. So we're about to make our first big purchase uh, and own one acre with a metal building. So we're hoping that over time we'll have a place to have classes. That's our, that's our vision. And a restroom. We need a restroom. <laughs> you need a restroom and you, you need electricity. Yes. Uh, and internet <laughs> connection. Yeah, and, 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 and air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> and to get away from the mosquitoes, but we need all those things. And, but we're working on it really hard and making extreme progress. So we hope in the, in a few years, if, if Audubon doesn't do it, or maybe if they want to do it, maybe we'll partner with them to help be their education. I haven't run that by them. I'm friends with them, but uh, anyway, we, we have, we have visions, but I hope y'all can there find a master naturalist program somewhere. You gotta have visions. That's right. <laughs> Does anyone have questions? Go ahead and speak up, but you'll have to unmute yourself. Oh, wow. Here's a long one <laughs> <laughs> from Bart. Uh, thanks, Robin. That was such a wonderful and interesting presentation. As for the pipe vine swallowtail, mm -hmm. the iridescent blue color serves as both a warning and sexual attractant. Oh, I should have figured figure that. Interesting. The orange dots are also warning signs. The pipe vine plant contains some really bitter compounds which are incorporated into the butterfly so that it is distasteful. It is so effective that mm. several other species of butterflies mimic the look of black and blue to avoid predation. Oh yeah, I'm so glad to know that. Um, I've noticed that there are many swallowtails that have that black, I mean that blue and uh, an orange and black uh, coloration. And so they're mimicking the pipe vine. Nice, I'm so glad to know that. Thank you. And uh, Jennifer Pack just posted that the uh, website for the Tennessee Naturalist is 
tnnaturalist.org. Oh, nice. So, any other questions? Go ahead and unmute yourself and raise your hand. Anyone? Well, I, I need to introduce you to Bart. Um, wave your hand, Bart. <laughs> <laughs> Bart is, uh, has done research on orchids that's similar, that I kept thinking of when I was looking at your flower drawings. Oh, wow. The things you observed were things that Bart has already noticed on orchids mm -hmm. and the oh. pollination strategies. He's yeah. also a butterfly expert. So yeah. Bart, meet Robin. Robin, meet hey, Bart. Robin. Oh, hey, <laughs> well, <Robin>. uncommon. <laughs> nice. And I'm in uh, <laughs> Oh, you're a Memphis, really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. I will, uh, um, I'll have to, are you on social media? Nope. <laughs> okay, well, good. Stay that way. I, I would connect with you there if you were. But, uh, but you're doing, where do, you, where, where do you do your orchid? Are you a professor? Oh, no, 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 no. This is all just, you know, just, you know. Citizen science. Nice. Yeah, I'm, science. Yes. Yeah, yes. I'm in science, but uh, this is all just hobby. Right. I have to look closer at an orchid now. Which are you looking at things like crane flower orchid and those sorts of orchids or? All of them. Yeah. Just, uh, I did a talk a few months ago. It's on our website. So if you want to look at oh, it. Wow. Yeah. I would definitely, I, orchids have really come to my attention over the past decade when you're down on the forest floor and all of a sudden a light beam hits and you're sitting right next to an orchid you didn't know was there five minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. That, that yeah. gets to me. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, if there are no further questions, I see Kim Sadler has posted. Wow, this was wonderful, Robin. Thank you. Oh, thank you all. Kim is a, a professor and an expert on, on the um, uh, cedar glades. Oh, <laughs> yes, cool. you are, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, but I, I, I know I, this is sitting here and I forgot I was going to show you all this. So I've been showing you all little snippets of my, this is my entire cypress tree illustration. When you put all the illustrations together, it forms a cypress tree. And you can see oh. the owl at the top. And I showed you all the pathonatory warbler there in the middle. But um, anyway, it's several, several things uh, that, that when you, uh, you know, you buy note cards and you can put them all together like a puzzle. And like, you know, anyway, I meant to show you all that too. So, uh, uh, intriguing. yeah. Intriguing. So I, 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 I really do encourage you next time, maybe you find yourself near a watercolor pad at Walmart, grab it and then put a piece in your pocket before you go out. You might find yourself feeling like a little kid again, as you maybe try things in your yard or on a hike. Uh, Jennifer Pack commented, love this presentation and love your artwork. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And I want to say thank you so much, too. Really, thank you for taking time out and talking with us. This is absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm so glad y'all are out there loving native plants, too. That, that makes me feel thank like, you, you know, y'all are my people. Thank you very much for 